Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you to our special question and answer webinar that is all about furlough and return to work and beyond. First of all, we'll do some introductions. So we'll have myself today. Um, I'll just be uh, fielding the questions or sorry, not fielding the questions, posing the questions. And my colleague Victoria, our HR knowledge manager, will be answering them for you. We're going to be covering the current situation where we are now, some of the options available, and then move on to the questions that you have submitted to us in advance of the webinar. Although we're covering many questions um, during the webinar, if you would like to submit further questions or it prompts um, another one in your head, then please feel free to submit them to us in the questions panel. Um, you will all be on mute because we've got a number of attendees on today, so um, we're keeping everybody on mute, but that doesn't prevent you from asking the questions still. If you go to your panel, you will see that there are, is a section that looks something like this. If you submit your questions to us in there, it will come straight through to us. We will collate them. It is likely that due to the length of the webinar, we will respond um, after the webinar directly to you. Um, so. We will respond to all questions though, so please feel free to um, submit them through to us. Now we've got the housekeeping over the way, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Victoria, who's going to take us through the first part of the webinar. I'll just share my... Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining our question and answer session this morning. Um, so we're going to begin um, the webinar um, to really just set out the current situation in re regards to the COVID-19 situation. Before we then just uh, go through some options that will be available to businesses, but really then the bulk of the uh, session this morning is going to be your questions and answers that you've um, you've kindly submitted questions over the last uh, few days or, and weeks. So uh, thank you for submitting those questions. So in terms of the current situation, the advice is still to work from home wherever possible. Anyone who cannot work from home should still be actively encouraged to attend work, who cannot work from home should be encouraged to attend work, but must avoid public transport wherever possible. If that's not possible, then public transport is to be used, but outside of peak commute times, and also face coverings are now mandatory. A return to work must be safe, and to help employees, the government have introduced guidance documents to make workplaces COVID-19 secure. And you can access these by visiting the link that I've shown on this slide here. And of course, we still have to keep a distance from people outside of our own households by maintaining at least two metres. It's important to keep hands and face as clean as possible, washing hands regularly, reducing the number of people that you spend time with within a work setting, avoid crowds and keep indoor places well ventilated. But also what's come up recently is that if possible, wear face coverings when in an enclosed space where social distancing is not possible or where you come into contact with people you do not normally meet. And remember, face coverings are mandatory on public transport. So before we get into the questions, we wanted just to set out some of the options that are available to you at this time from a resource planning perspective. So, of course, furlough that's the the, the biggie um, that we're all hearing about at the moment and we had an update on Friday evening from the Chancellor so I just want to spend a little bit of time just going through what those changes are so throughout June and July there's not going to be any change to the payment terms of the scheme the minimum duration of being furloughed is three weeks that's in June only and the government will obviously continue to pay that 80% of the wage costs, which are capped at 2,500. But then from the 1st of July, a new flexible furlough option is being introduced. And what that means is that employees can start to return part time alongside being furloughed. So, for example, a full time employee is brought back for two days and is paid for those two days as normal. The remaining three days will be furloughed, for which 80% grant can be claimed from the government. 
claim is for a minimum of one week rather than the previous duration of three weeks. The 30th of June, that's the date that the current scheme will close to new entrants, which meant that the 10th of June was the final date by which an employer could have furloughed an employee for the first time in order for that current three week furlough period to be completed by the end of June. However, there is an exception. Those on maternity adoption or paternity leave um, do not have to be um, furloughed by that deadline. Um, it would be discriminatory for those employees who are due to return in the coming months, not being allowed to participate in the scheme. So there's no cut off for those employees. We then have from August, um, where we see employers starting to contribute. Employers will pay the national insurance and pension contributions. The government will continue paying the 80% and capped at 2,500. Then in September, of the 80% furlough pay, the government will pay 70%, which will be capped at 2,187 pounds 50, versus the employer who will contribute 10%. And then from October, of that 80% furlough pay, the government will pay the 60% versus the employer who will pay the 20%. Further guidance can be found in the government's guidance document, which is at this link that's on the web page here. So there are a number of other options available to businesses. Layoffs is one. So long as you have a contractual right to do so, this is a temporary measure to lay off employees. Um, and anybody that's got over one month service, um, they would become eligible for statutory government payment of £29 per day for five days in any three month period. This could be used if you anticipate work picking up in the near future and you see the return of your uh, employees back to the workplace. You then have an option of short time working. So that again is temporary which will again require you to have the contractual right to impose it. Short time working is where employees work reduced hours and have their pay reduced accordingly. Both these two options could still be achieved if you didn't have the contractual clause allowing it. However, if this is the case, it's really vital and important that you consult and seek written consent and agreement to it. Otherwise, you could face breach of contract or constructive dismissal claims, but in theory, it could still be an option for you. And of course, redundancy. If you are cont contemplating making redundancies, then it is crucial that you follow legislation in terms of consultation and a fair process. So you need to be aware of deadlines for starting consultation. Do also check your contracts of employment to check what the notice periods are in case you enhance notice. And this will help you in planning the timing of when you commence the process. You can run notice periods simultaneously to periods of furlough. And by way of reminder, if you're planning to make more than 100 roles redundant, then you're required to consult for 45 days. If you plan to make between 20 and 100 roles redundant, but um, you're required to consult for 30 days. But of course, if you're planning to make less than 20 roles redundant, consultation has to be sufficiently long enough to ensure you conduct meaningful consultation. So we would recommend in general a two-week consultation process, but obviously some situations may warrant more. Be careful to not inadvertently discriminate by making those on furlough redundant. So as you'll know, furlough can be used for those with caring responsibilities. So those on furlough for this reason are likely to be female employees. Equally, employees who are shielding can also be furloughed, in which case they'll, be, they'll have a very serious medical condition which is likely to qualify as a disability under the Equality Act. So taking a stance to choose those on furlough to be made redundant, therefore could render the dismissal discriminatory and unfair. And then of course, a final option is about unfurloughing your staff and bringing them back to the workplace. Whether this is um, bringing them back to work and working from home or literally into the workplace. So make sure you can justify those employees who you have unfurloughed over other employees by keeping records of the approach that you're taking. So we're going to move now on to the uh, main part of our webinar and we're going to um, go through the many questions that we've received um, from you all. So thank you for sending these in. Mm. 
Mm. Okay. okay, so I'm going to invite Sue to um, pose the question and then we'll take um, each question in turn. So over to you, Sue. Thank you, Victoria. Um, so our first question that we're handling today, we have grouped them, by the way, into topic areas to hopefully make them flow. Um, but, and hope, but if we haven't answered your question fully, or if you have subsequent questions, then put them through on the panel as we explained earlier. So our first question is, we have six people furloughed in different roles. The two of them, work is now available, although one of them needs to shield. How would you suggest we handle this? Okay, so um, firstly, those shielding are classed as clinically extremely vulnerable and they're strongly advised to stay at home as much as possible and to keep visits outside to a minimum, for instance, once per day. Um, so they're going to need to take extra precautions to prevent themselves from coming into contact with the virus. Um, now, this is the advice as at today, and from what I understand on the government websites, um, they plan to review it at the end of June, 30th of June. So it could be we see some changes to this from July onwards, but it's um, but as at today, um, that is the current position. Um, and we also know that uh, they slightly lifted their lockdown measures, didn't they, about a week, two weeks ago by saying that they could um, go outside of the house. So from an employment point of view, um, employees must therefore support where they can for employees um, who are shielding, um, given the seriousness of the virus and the risks uh, to these employees that they'll be under. Um, I would say the very the most important thing is your risk assessment process. So you've got work that's uh, become available again. You've got two people, one of those who is shielding, but is it too much of a risk to bring them back or not? Now that's um, for you to uh, determine through your risk assessment process. But in terms of what options you could um, consider, so can they come back to work but work from home? That's going to be the obvious one because even for everybody, the government's encouraging everybody to work from home as a preferred option. If not, if they can't work from home, then can they perhaps take up some temporary alternative duties that allows them to work from home? So it's just thinking about their role, the work that's become available again as business perhaps is picking up and just think creatively um, because ultimately we've got to safeguard them. You could consider whether changing their hours of work. Um, so, and this may be more of an unlikely scenario, but it could still exist for some employers, but you could look at changing hours so that they're on site in work, but at a time when not many other people are. Um, as I said, it's probably going to be more of an unlikely scenario, but it is one that is there for discussion with your employee. Um, so just bear that one in mind. Um, and then, of course, we've got furlough. So um, I'm assuming from the question, perhaps the employee was furloughed due to the lack of work up to now. But actually, furlough was broadened as a scheme probably a month, two months ago to allow people who were shielding to be furloughed. So that potentially could be an option for you if they've been, obviously they've been furloughed in the past. Um, so even though the work is still coming about and becoming available, if the risks are too high and you can't make suitable adaptations to the workplace, to the, to the work role, to the hours, then actually consider your furlough. Um, and then I guess if they were to be furloughed, that still presents a challenge because you're getting the work becoming available. Um, so one option could be to um, perhaps engage with the other people that are furloughed, so the four other people. Would any of them want to come in and temporarily undertake work, maybe you know, changing their duties temporarily, and they fulfill the work that's become available now? And you do that through consultation discussion with them to see who would volunteer. Or another option is you could temporarily recruit staff to cover that piece of work, but I guess perhaps given the current situation, it might not be financially viable for businesses. I don't know. But nonetheless, it's it's obviously still an option, um, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, you've got work activity there. 
the person that isn't there to do it is furloughed for genuine valid reasons and you know you need to look at how you get that work completed so it's about thinking creatively so I hope that helps thank you Victoria so let's go on to the next question okay so our next question is how do we manage flexible furlough so we didn't okay. even have this as a term, did we, um, a couple of weeks ago? So here we are now with flexible furlough <laughs> being part of the vocabulary daily. I know. <laughs> and people might have seen the uh, uh, the acronym that's uh, the abbreviation that <laughs> is being given to it. But um, the so flexible furlough, we've we've finally had some details now over the last week around what that looks like. Um, so essentially, for the hours that the employee is going to work, they're going to receive a proportionate amount of pay that's based on their normal contractual pay. So they are due whatever they're due under their contract of employment. So say, for example, they're coming in on a Monday and Tuesday, you pay them as normal. And so for the hours or the days the employee isn't working, they're now entitled, which is new because they never used to be, but they're now entitled to be furloughed. And so you'd be claiming through the furlough scheme a proportionate amount of pay at the furlough rate, so in a proportionate amount of the 80%, a pro rata amount of that 80% for those three days that they're not in work. So um, it's perhaps going to be quite where, where you've got a number of people that are going to be doing the flexible furlough, then obviously it's going to take a piece of work to actually work out everybody's individual calculations. Um, however, the government have given some guidance documents with examples of how you can work out um, what that pay looks like for what you're going to claim because you would have some people that may be on um, the same rate each month they're on that set hour the set pay um, and then you have people that you know are going to have to get uh, variable hours and how you work out that 80 percent uh, proportionally for the the hours that they're on furlough um, so I've put the links here on the slide um, to take note of a publication and as I said there are examples of how you can work out the 80% of the wages um, and when you do notify the HMRC you're going to need to let them know the usual number of hours that they would ordinarily work in that claim period with the number of hours the employee has or will work in that claim period so I think, unfortunately, it's going to probably take a little bit of processing and uh, getting together the data. Uh, but nonetheless, there's um, tools there to help employers to try and work that out. Does it does it actually cover, uh, do you know, whether if an employee has variable hours of work each week, how you work out what their usual hours are? Is it the traditional average over a period of time? I think you know? they have. I think they've got an example in there. I'd have to double check. Um, because we know that the furlough scheme allows for those those that group of a workforce that obviously are variable um, hours so I would have thought they would have a, a calculation in there but I'd have to double yeah. check. There, there is a range of calculations I haven't looked at all of them um, but yeah as you say they, they have got one for furlough anyway how you calculate the variable pay haven't they mm. so I would imagine they just continued that through for the yeah. flexible furlough scheme okay thank you okay so so the next question how much notice should we give to people to bring them back to work following furlough this is an interesting one <laughs> it is because I, I guess uh, for many um, employees that perhaps have got it written into any agreements that um, allows them to immediately recall people to work um, however even though you may have that in any written agreement you still need to uh, be reasonable and give a reasonable notice for coming back um, with employment law as i'm sure you probably all know the word reasonable isn't defined so um, you're going to need to consider the circumstances of each situation that you're dealing with um, but just some things for you to bear in mind and consider um, First of all, take on board the fact that for some people returning to work, um, they may need a period of time to mentally prepare for it. So remember, for some people, they, they you know, have been off for a number of months, three months or so. Um, and so they may just need a little bit of time just to sort of start getting mentally ready for returning. Um, 
especially given what we've all been dealing with um, over the last few months. And we continue because we're obviously trying to um, come out of this pandemic. There's also the added challenge about primary schools. Now, um, we've also heard recently primary schools won't be fully opening until at least September. Now, some years have gone back. So we would urge employees to be mindful and considerate of those employees um, who have children, listen to any ch uh, challenges they may have and work out some fair and reasonable plan that helps them both, but also sees them returning you know, fairly soon. Um, in regards to furlough, if your employee has been previously furloughed um, and they're now in fact struggling to work due to caring responsibilities, then you can furlough them. So as I said earlier, the furlough scheme was broadened a while back to allow people with caring responsibilities to uh, be eligible for the scheme. So that could be an option uh, that would help uh, an employee. Um, so working parents or employees with other caring responsibilities may need a brief period of time to put those new arrangements in place that can allow them to return to work. Remember, for many people, you know, they won't be able to rely on grandparents for childcare. So, you know, there's a lot of challenges for everybody. Um, also consider perhaps you may have people that's on furlough um, who have been undertaking training during their period. You know, it's been a perfect opportunity. So what has that training program looked like? You know, has it been a e-learning module, online modules that have been taking over a period of weeks? You know, in which case are they uh, still yet to finish it? So you might want to think about how you can allow them to finish that training and um, consider that in terms of planning for when they come back into work. So, I guess there's no black and white answer. It's what's reasonable for the circumstances. For one person, 48 hours may be sufficient versus for another person, they may need a week to find and uh, you know childcare provisions. It all really does depend. Um, but um, I guess just talk to your employees and see uh, you know the practical challenges that may be faced with them and hopefully see how you can get a, a timely return to work. Um, but it's about being reasonable and fair. So, our next question is, can you give notice while someone is on furlough? Is this allowed within the job retention scheme? That's, that is a really interesting, good question that's been asked. Um, so I think it has been debated quite a bit, but yes, you can give notice or someone is on furlough. Um, ACAS actually recently brought out some guidance to say you can continue with redundancy processes whilst employees are on furlough. So in terms of the coronavirus job retention grants, you can also still claim the grants if eligible for salaries paid by the employer, even if the employee is working out their notice period. But what is not so clear is whether you can pay that notice period at the 80% furlough pay agreed or whether you have to top it up to their normal salary. The legal arguments for and against paying at 100% are very complex. Um, but if you decide to pay at 80% um, and an employee is subsequently successful at a tribunal, then you would have to pay the difference at that point in time. However, in such circumstances, the employer would not be able to rely on any post-termination clause if the tribunal um, rules a breach of contract. Um, the thing to say, perhaps with tribunals at this point in time, um, they're envisaging that perhaps cases could take a good 18 months to two years to come to a, a hearing. So um, just thought that might be of interest to employers to know sort of where we are in the, the, the scheme of things. But yes, you can give notice. Thank you. There we go, next question. So, when on furlough, what classes is training? Now, that's an interesting one as well. <laughs> it, it is. Um, and so, as everybody will know, um, people are entitled to undergo and complete training whilst on furlough. So training could be anything, you know, continuous professional development, uh, training that's needed for people to remain competent in the role, especially those if it's regulated. Um, 
what perhaps will be different during a period of furlough is how training is carried out um, and I think even for the coming months we're going to see training being delivered in a much different way so we're going to see um, more and more e-learning uh, webinars um, you know training isn't your traditional face-to-face -face in a classroom so yes people can uh, continue with training it could be anything continuous professional development um, and do that while they're on furlough thank you I hope that helps yep sorry Sue yes that's fine thank you <laughs> <laughs> Now, I know this question had us thinking, didn't it? Um, it did. Can the 10, 20% contribution towards furlough in September and October be paid as holiday if staff cannot return to work? We think we came, we think we got the okay. answer to this one. <laughs> so, okay, so let's park the 10, 20% for a moment because the principles are gonna be the same. So the same rules on holiday continue to apply throughout furlough. So how we've managed it up to now will continue to be managed. So what that essentially is going to mean is that um, if employees want to take holiday, they can do. But equally, if as an employer, you want to ask the employees to take some leave because it could be a way of preventing mass annual leave occurring next year, then you're also entitled to do this and ask them. But so long as you give notice, double the length of leave. So if you want them to take one week, for example, you must by law give them two weeks notice to that request. So th that's generally the principles about how you can manage holiday through furlough. And then the final and the, the main essential answer to this question is that when on holiday, furlough workers must get their holiday pay in full whilst you, um, so you top up to the 100%. And that's because you need to comply with the working time regulations. So essentially in September, in October, regardless of whether you're contributing the 10%, the 20%, that employee should come away with 100% of their pay. So I hope that answers that question. <laughs> but it did get us thinking. It did. <laughs> okay, so our next question was, how would layoff be beneficial in lockdown? Okay, so um, if as a result of lockdown, um, your business has been severely impacted to the extent that you don't have enough work, then as I said earlier, if your contract of employment contains a layoff clause, um, you can ask that employee to stay at home in the short term and it's unpaid leave. Obviously, there's an entitlement to a statutory payment if they've got their one month service, which is obviously very limited. Um, but nonetheless, if it is really a short term thing you need to make a decision on, you can utilize that whilst we're in lockdown and coming out of lockdown. So it really is just a different type of mechanism um, in which you can manage the challenge of loss of work. Clearly, if um, longer term you suspect there's challenges to the business surviving or the structure remaining as it is, is probably gonna be unlikely and you're gonna need to think more longer term about more permanent jobs, uh, just structures in your business then short term uh, lockdown um, layoff sorry you wouldn't necessarily be relevant you would normally be looking then into your normal redundancy process okay so this is one that's coming up quite a lot actually with some of our clients through our helplines um, so if the company's suffering from financial pressures how can we give assurances to our staff about their salaries and benefits? Okay, because yeah, I mean, it's really difficult for everybody, for businesses and for the employees. And I would say the key thing is about being open and transparent in all your communications, but, uh, you know, keeping people regularly updated um, because really you, you're trying to keep them engaged and um, whilst you can't commit and give false promises, um or promise things that you may not be able to sustain just having those open honest conversations would actually probably help people longer term in moving through this uh difficult period that we're all facing um so be open and honest with your employees talk about the steps that you're taking as a business to manage costs you know you know where you're trying to cut the costs through any processes um and things like that and um just 
be open and transparent and, and engage with them and people will feel valued and benefit uh, appreciate that i think i think it's more important than ever that you have regular communications um even team updates even mm. with your furloughed staff throughout this period just to keep them posted as to what's going on even if there's not a lot going on just to tell them that just to keep yeah. the contact going um it is very easy to lose that um the, the sort of team spirit if you're not careful um when you're having a lot of stress trying to manage and keep your business going and yeah. as, as well as um you know motivate the staff who may be working but under different circumstances yeah yeah thank you sue so training, training. And moving on to training mm. So this this is a personal one for me, actually, because it's happened to us. Um, just before lockdown, we'd recruited a new employee. What happens with their probation period and training? So I had someone start the day of lockdown. Yes, um, it's very challenging, isn't it? And, um, you know, and for those that have been new to joining a business just before lockdown or, you know, it is very likely they're going to benefit from part or even all of their induction being repeated. So three months out of the workplace is a long time, especially if you've only just joined an organisation. Um, so yes, absolutely, I would say um, repeat probably all of that induction piece again. Um, in terms of the probation period, I would say pause that through the lockdown if they've not been working. Um, because you know it's about being fair and reasonable to employees and if they've not been working how can you we haven't got any performance to assess in terms of those who have been working um and their probation period has continued then we would urge you to be more considerate of the challenging circumstances um that's come about through lockdown so when you sit come to sit down and review the the probation at the end of that probation period um for example if they've been working from home but never done that before you know that's going to be a big change for somebody or if they've remained in the office but their line managers had to work from home you know that separation of line management responsibilities and um, line manager employee relationship these are all factors that could impact somebody um, in their integration into the business and in starting a new job and learning a new job so for me i'd say it's entirely reasonable for instance to extend somebody's probation if it's due for review um, and you've not really been able to see the, the desired performance and you know we've we've all encountered lots of challenges and we're all working our way through this challenging time so I think that perhaps is a fair response if you're due to literally review anybody's probation. Thank you. So another one associated with training so we've introduced new working practices what is the best way to communicate these to all staff including those on furlough okay so it's really important that you ensure the whole workforce are trained on new working practices because it, we need everybody to work safely into the same rules and standards um, so for those on furlough certainly get in touch with them before returning as this will help them plan for returning then when they're back on site you can take them through new processes that have been introduced and how you do this can depend on the extent of the change and what the change is um, it may be you want to utilize written memos communications that you feel they're perhaps efficient if the change is perhaps very minor or it may be you want to hold more of a team meeting obviously socially distancing through means such as skype or microsoft teams um, and talk them through those changes um, that, that's put particularly more important if the changes are quite big um, and there's perhaps a few of them. Um, an alternative way is you could actually pull together a guide, an employee guide um, that details the changes that are being introduced, why and set out new processes that are coming about um, and share that guide out and um, make sure that people read it, understand it, if they've got any questions, obviously raise those questions. Um, and just a final point, just remember, as we've said earlier in, in this Q&A, those people on furlough can still undergo training whilst on furlough. So um, absolutely just um, find a way that's appropriate for your business, for the type of changes you're making. But what's critical is that everybody's aware of them, understands them and um, implements them. Thank you. 
and, and linked with that one, it, it's daunting to reopen the workplace as the virus is still around. How can I reassure my staff? This is also something that a lot of yeah. people are asking us at the moment. It, it's a big question that's coming through to us. Um, it's a nerve-wracking nerve time, I think, for everybody, um, whether it's about reopening the schools and coming back to work. Um, the first and most important thing is your risk assessment. Um, so not only can you bring people, you, you need that to bring people back, sorry, um, and it also tells your workforce what it is you're going to be doing to manage their safety and work, at work. So it goes without saying that for many people they will be they will be nervous at returning. So we'd suggest not only share your risk assessments and explain what you're doing and why, but also provide guidance to your line managers on what they should do if there's suspected cases at work. Now we're hopefully we won't have that, but the reality is there perhaps could be new cases. Um, so it is a big responsibility for everybody, um, but if you can provide guidance to your managers around knowing what symptoms are associated with the virus, give them the reassurance that they can and should send somebody home who displays the symptoms, then this will help reassure them they're doing the right thing and all they can as an employer. Um, you can also look to display posters. So I know the government have introduced um, a one-page poster that can be displayed across workplaces. And that poster is a way to act as a reminder to people about what you're doing as a business to protect their safety. So the government have introduced one um, that tells people that A, you've carried out risk assessments, that you have procedures for cleaning, hand washing and hygiene in place. Um, that you're allowing where possible for people to continue working from home and that where that isn't possible that you've taken all reasonable steps to maintain a two meter distance and those key points are factored into this poster and being able to visualize it and see that it's that constant reminder for your workforce that you know you're on it you're doing everything you can um, and ultimately training communication is also going to be key to help reassure and support people in returning but I accept it's going to be a, a nerve-wracking time for many people um, and making that first step is probably going to be the hardest but once that first day is, is over and done with they'll have that sense of well I've seen it in practice now I've seen the reality of it it's not that bad I feel comfortable but it is very difficult I, I, I know And then, and then leading on from that, do you have any thoughts around how the role could be adjusted while we are still in the pandemic? Okay, so I guess the first question is, is whether the role that person takes is one that can work from home. So as we know, the government's still pushing for working, working from home as a preferred option, but of course that's not always possible. Um, so then think about if the role can't 100% work from home, could there be a middle ground? So could the employee work from home two days but be on site three days and therefore what you're doing is you're limiting the amount of time they're on site and with groups of people. Um, you could look at the role and see if there are any different ways in which some of those tasks can be carried out with the aim of limiting meeting time um, and limiting face-to-face -face interaction. So look at the job description, what activities can be done differently and using technology. Um, what you're trying to achieve is to allow somebody to work in a safe way in line with the latest advice. Um, and as we know, the advice is to still keep that two metres distance and limit that contact with people, which I know for many um, workplaces perhaps can be a bit of a challenge and it's trying to think creatively of what you can do. Um, but of course, it's not just about the role, but also the work environment. So if you can ensure the workplace is set up to allow assistance, social distancing, even if there's little you can undertake with the role or the hours, um, then you can still ensure it's carried out in a safe environment in line with public health advice and um, have people at least two metres apart. Um, so there's quite a few things and I'll just say it's about being creative and engage with your workforce and seek people's views and feelings about uh, and ideas about what else can be carried out. You know, you might want to have a rotor system in place um, so people are working different hours, so you're limiting the number of people in at any one time. Um, so there's a number of things really that can be done. Thank you. So um, this person had a, has a salesperson who works mostly in London and has to travel by public transport. 
he has underlying medical conditions and is very nervous about returning. So given it is now mandatory to wear a face mask on public transport, can we insist he travels, assuming his clients wish to have him on site? A number of questions there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very difficult and challenging and trying to strike that balance. Um, it would most likely be deemed unreasonable to force your employee to travel given the health condition and the anxiety and you know the nature of the, the COVID-19 you know being severe as it is um, so I would urge employees that you know find ways to put measures in place that would safeguard him um, can you change um, the hours of work so um, he's traveling at quieter times so when the public transport isn't busy um, that's on the back of government advice uh, obviously he'll uh, be wearing the face masks coverings can he do any of the work from home that's a key thing as well because essentially um, that again is still the government's advice the preferred option is to work from home if possible now obviously if looking at the question he's a sales person isn't he so perhaps he won't be able to do the whole work um, working from home but could he perhaps say at least have a day at home so he can do a catch up on the admin do any phone calls follow up um, and then it's a, a proportion out on the road um, then I guess if he perceives the risks too high and we'll probably come on to this in a question we've got coming up I think if the risks are too high then explore the use of um, reasonable time off holiday to support a period of absence from the workplace um, it's difficult um, and also I don't know much about the nature of the medical condition um, but in theory if he falls within the extremely vulnerable category ie he has to shield then if he has been furloughed in the past then obviously that would be an option that's open to the employer again uh, because he'd be able to be furloughed once more so it's really, really tricky. Um, I think uh, you'd be it'd be dangerous to force somebody to, and I'll come on to talk more about the, the law around that in uh, one of our questions we've got coming up. Um, so really, I'd urge you to try and think creatively about how you can enable him to work. But a tricky one, that. Mm. And, and this question is a common yeah. one um, through the helpline as well. Where do we stand with employees who refuse to return to work following furlough? Okay, so this is perhaps, um, this is really hard and we are seeing this come through an awful lot and it's understandable where people, like I said on the question a moment ago, people feeling nervous. So let's assume that you've carried out a full and thorough risk assessment because that's your first priority. You have to put in place measures to ensure the social distancing and the right steps to um, manage the risks um, and make whatever adaptations you have to make. So let's assume you've done all that and from, um, but despite this, your employee fears returning to work, which is understandable. I think there's going to be heightened anxiety at this point in time and in general um, because of the nature of COVID. Then the best way forward is to try and seek that middle ground, finding that compromise. So um, there you, you feel on the one hand that you've got a safe workplace. There's no reason why they can't work. The work's available. But on the other hand, they're in a disagreement with you and therefore they're then refusing to work um, then have that conversation explore with them and try and find a middle ground which could be some time off now I'm going to just go through the law that is a backdrop to the context to this so you've got the management of health and safety work regulations they first of all require that businesses make suitable and sufficient assessment of risks to employees health and safety so that's the risk assessment part that I've just moment, uh, mentioned a moment ago you then have under the Employment Rights Act of 96, employees are protected when acting to protect their own or others' safety. And so an employee has a right not to be subjected to any detriment or be unfairly dismissed where the employee reasonably believed the danger to be so serious and imminent and chose to refuse attending work. Now, the words serious and imminent are key because it's highly likely 
okay this hasn't been tested but given what we're hearing in the um i guess the legal profession and in the hr world a tribunal is most likely going to deem covid19 as a serious and imminent threat for the purpose of the employment relations act employment rights act sorry so what we also have under the employment rights act is that employees must show that there were circumstances of danger which they reasonably believe to be serious and imminent and it won't matter what the employer thought what will matter is what the employee reasonably believed and it's that word reasonable again <laughs> but it's what they reasonably believed at the time they acted i.e refusing work we also have um like with unlike general dismissal claims an employee who brings a claim relating to health and safety does not need the usual two-year service to bring a claim so dismissals on health and safety grounds are automatically under uh, unfair under the employment rights act we then have a further piece of law that we have to be mindful about under the employment rights act which relates to employees who make protected disclosures also known as whistleblowing in that they're protected from dismissal selection for redundancy often being made subject to a detriment so knowing all of that legal framework that we're having to work in you think the workplace is safe the employee doesn't you need to have that conversation and try and find that middle ground and i would say that probably agreeing to a period of uh, leave of absence um, is the middle ground and would be a reasonable approach I think it would be dangerous to take somebody through a disciplinary process for the, the reasons I've just mentioned around the, the legislation background, um, because COVID is likely to be seen as that um, serious and imminent threat. So I think there is risk to uh, perhaps using a disciplinary framework and um, to really try and find that middle ground of agreeing that time out from the workplace. The added complication, um, is around um, there's a divided view or a divided opinion on whether that leave of absence is paid or not and it's complex and we won't really know until it gets tested in a court which is about it could be anywhere 18 months two years away um, so we don't yet know what the definitive legal position is on whether you treat this leave as paid or unpaid so really I guess things to think about you know you could take a commercial view and decide to treat it as unpaid knowing that if the courts do not support that position then you will pay the individual later down the line and as well as dealing with any tribunal claim or end up with any settlement process so effectively you're choosing to delay when you may have to pay the individual alternatively you may feel a better commercial decision would be to pay for the leave or even some of it on the basis that the threat of damage to the company's reputation if you didn't could be viewed more harmful to the business than not so for example the impact on employee engagement you know word gets out so think about your employee engagement any bad publicity that may come out uh, during this very difficult time especially on social media you know we we see a lot of people you going to social media for things and also think about your reputation in the local area at probably a time where we're going to be moving into a phase where perhaps the recruitment market is going to become very competitive so for some businesses who may be able to finance this period of leave um, and it may only apply to a handful of cases they may conclude actually it's less damaging and commercially let's pay for that period of leave and you know we want to treat our employees the best we can um, so that's I guess the way of looking at it um, I can't give you a definitive position on the pay side um, I would certainly discourage the disciplinary framework as I said because of the 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 rights employees have at work with being protected um, and I guess the final thing to sort of think about you can of course allow a certain amount of annual leave if that's perhaps a, a solution for parties but it is a difficult one and perhaps when we do see a common um but it, it's really tricky because um you know you're on the one hand feel that you've got work there and you're, you're offering a safe workplace and and i would say it comes back to how you communicate and engage with people and if you've been engaging right from the beginning about what you're doing 
what steps you're taking, sharing your risk assessments, you're more likely to gain a better buy-in, aren't you, from your workforce, and they're sort of going through the journey with you. Um, but of course, people will have heightened anxiety at this time, it's understandable, and that's also what we should think about as an, a reasonable employer. You know, it's not normal times at the moment, and people who may ordinarily be able to deal with quite, you know, difficult times may not be at this point in time. So, um, yeah, quite um, a long answer, I know, but um, it's not really straightforward. So I hope that helps. Okay, so flexible working requests are also on the increase at the moment. So this is somebody whose childcare remains an issue and they ask to work flexibly or to work from home. I presume that means they can work from home. Um, yeah, but yes, okay. So this is a good question, and as I said earlier, we're probably going to experience it more and more, especially with uh, the situation with schools, um, especially primary schools not going back fully till September, and we, you know, we still don't know about um, secondary schools. Um, so I would say a tribunal will view this period as being very unprecedented, and will expect employees to be more flexible than usual to support their workforce. Um, so I know that's probably not particularly clear, but just um, they would expect more of an employer than uh, normal. So there's some, probably some several thoughts around what you can do. Um, if the employee's previously been furloughed, then of course you could look to use a furlough scheme again. Um, we know that's in place until the 31st of October. And um, obviously, yes, you will have to contribute to it later on, um, but nonetheless, it's there as a potential option. Um, so that could be a consideration for you. Another option, um, and this is where tribunals would expect more leniency with regards to flexible working, is to accommodate some kind of temporary change, uh, either to working hours to help that employee juggle the demands of working and homeschooling or childcare. Um, and, um, you know, you could be creative and it all comes from the conversations you have with the employee, understanding their challenges, their circumstances and trying to be as creative as possible. You know, so can they make up some other hours later on in the day? So they've got a period of time out from their work during the day to, to deal with the childcare. Perhaps their partner then comes back from work and then you can take over, uh, they can take over and you can then uh, continue with a few hours. It's not ideal and we're all going to have to make sacrifices and temporary changes, but um, you know, that's perhaps one way of uh, helping somebody juggle their, their commitments. Um, or can they reduce their working hours in some way? Um, it might not be ideal to you as a business, um, but it might work, equally it might work, given that we're recovering at this point and trying to build our businesses back again. Um, so it may be there actually probably is more scope to look at reduced working hours. Um, and things like, um, you know, if they do a typical nine to five, Monday to Friday job, could any of their hours be worked at a weekend as a way of giving them that time off um, back in the week? Um, I think it's about knowing your employee, knowing their circumstances and challenges. You know, so somebody that's a single parent is going to be in a very different, different situation to somebody that's not. Um, and just try and find creative ways of being able to accommodate uh, changing their hours. Um, you know, I think there's there's got to be some flexibility in a tribunal that expect you to, expect you to be really thorough and creative in thinking about what you can do. Um, so the there is a probably thought about working from home, but I think the challenge with that is you know so say somebody's got a two year old well clearly they can't work from home because they can't work and look after a, a two year old. Well, but whereas if that employee has got a child that's perhaps you know a bit older, 10, 11, um, they've probably been set off at the start of the day with some homeschooling and perhaps you can give them a few hours of going through their schoolwork, that might be able to enable you to then go and do a few hours. It is difficult, it will be hard, but there's probably, um, you know, some thought you could give around that and obviously not forcing it on anybody. Um, have that conversation and see how creative you can be. Um, so 
everybody will have different sets of circumstances. As I said, some people might be single parents, some people might rely on grandparents and so can't uh, utilise that support at this point. Um, but just be as flexible as you can and even more so than in, in ordinary times. Okay, so oh, linked with the one we had earlier, one of our employees has to, has to use public transport to get to work, so what is our responsibility here? Um, mm. Okay, so um, well, on the one hand we're being told by the uh, government to avoid public transport, um, where it can't be avoided then employees or people should be using it outside commute times um, and we also know that people uh, must use face masks. So. If an employee can only get to work through public transport, then a reasonable action would be to allow them to change their hours. So their travel to work and back home is done so as safely as possible. So outside the commute times, as we're being advised by the, the government. So it's around that flexibility again. Um, as an employer, there's a legal duty to take reasonable care for the health and safety of the employees. Um, so you need to be really flexible and considerate of how you can make uh, supportive measures to allow that employee to come to work. Um, changing hours is probably the obvious. Um, given the seriousness of the pandemic and the extent of it, um, I think a tribunal will expect employees to act more fle flexibly, as I said in the last question, um, than in ordinary times, um, and especially in the management of their staff. Um, so if the government are advising to not use public transport, that really needs to give some careful consideration. Um, and hopefully you can find a way of them carrying out their work, coming to work outside the commute times, the peak commute times. Mm. It's difficult. It is. And get, it's just being creative again. Is there, is there any other it way is. around it to avoid them having to do it? It is and it, it all it, it all comes back to that uh, engagement, isn't it, with your staff and keeping that communication open and honest. And you know, if you've had that from the beginning and you've been working with them, then you know when you come to these little challenges about how you work out getting somebody to work, you know, your, your conversations are going to more likely to be constructive, positive, and you know, hopefully find those solutions. Um, but I think the key thing to always bear in mind is. Uh, from a risk point of view, a tribunal will expect you to be more flexible at this point in time than in ordinary times and will expect you to sort of uh, be more accommodating than you would normally be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this is the kind of opposite of the question we answered earlier. This is somebody who wants to return to work, but he's shielding um, and obviously the company are concerned about any responsibilities they might have or they might become responsible for um, mm. if they do return to work when they should really be shielding. Uh, we have been asked this before as well um, and sh should they get them to sign a disclaimer? Um, hmm. Okay so um, I said earlier on the um, in one of the questions around the shielding in that they're obviously from an extremely vulnerable group medically We've got the certain advice at this point in time up to the 30th of June where they need to be limiting their, in, their time outside and, and obviously certainly not to work um, or be with groups. So there is still um, an element of being more cautious with this group. So if somebody is wanting to, is approaching you saying they want to return to work, um, I'm guessing they will have been on furlough perhaps um, and wants to bring their furlough to an end. Let's assume that. Um, so it comes back to your risk assessment. Um, that's going to be a key, um, a key uh, action point for um, driving the conversations and planning for any return. Um, the I think from some of the things that I've said before around can they carry out, um, well first of all can that role that they do work from home? Um, that's going to be probably the first question in any scenario we're going to have, isn't it? Because that is still the government's preferred option. If you're returning to work, well, can you really work from home if at all possible? Um, so that's one thing. If they can't, then can you give them some temporary duties that would allow them to still work from home? Um, that's what you're trying to achieve first, I think, being able to do the work or some work at home. 
if that's then probably out the equation and you are literally thinking about can you make the workplace safe to have somebody that's shielding um, again it's around the working hours so can those working hours be worked in a way where they're coming on site with very few people you know bearing in mind that you'll already taken extra measures with uh, you know your cleaning of the the workplace you know there'll be hand sanitizer you know you'll be doing all those measures so they've got that with them and they will be obviously encouraged to keep washing their hands and stuff like that um that could be an option the reality of how likely that is i don't know because i think to do that you it must be quite um small workplace i guess um because if you think back to the government advice is they should still really be keeping themselves away from groups of people it's a really difficult when i think the shielding um you know fortunately we're, we're we're fortunate that we have the furlough scheme that still covers people who are shielding um you know and i can absolutely see how somebody who's been in isolation for three months just wants to get back to normal and wants that interaction i totally get that but it's about managing the risks so i think use your risk assessment framework as a starting point use it with a discussion with that person explore working from home as a priority if they can have that working from home um i guess from an interaction point of view they won't get it to the same extent but you've got like your team meetings over the you know microsoft teams and skype that you can use um and then then look at what practical measures you could perhaps take to the workplace to allow them to come back safely but i don't know how likely that would be it's a difficult one but we should hopefully get an update yeah at the end of the month um, so, are we allowed to refuse an employee on site? So, in a short answer, um, yes, and so I'll explain. <laughs> so, your employee, first of all, the employee has the right to return to work if they're able, ready, and willing to do so. However, equally, you have a legal obligation to take reasonable care for the health and safety of your employees in the workplace. So, obviously, I don't know the reason behind why, you know, there's this refusal. So let's just assume, so say for example, the employee's wanting to come back, but they've got symptoms. Well, therefore they're not gonna be able to come back to work. We're not gonna to want to allow them. So we're entitled to refuse their return to work. And if somebody has those symptoms, then obviously they've got the eligibility for SSP. Um, now, they could possibly ask to work from home if they have got symptoms, but with that, then just from a health and safety and just supporting point of view, you know, clearly if they're relatively mild symptoms, not causing them too much impact on being able to undertake work, then yes, working from home could be a possibility. And then that way they're still getting their normal pay, aren't they? They're not having to go on to SSP. Um, so yes, you can refuse. And I, I guess uh, there's also another piece around um declarations i don't know if any employers out there are using um you know from those of you who are listening are using self-declaration forms you know that is one example of how you can before somebody comes back to work you can ask them to complete a one two page form and that form could ask questions around you know have you been in contact with anybody with covid19 symptoms in the last 14 days do you currently have any of the following covid19 symptoms and obviously you'd state what they are um have you um recently returned from overseas in the last 14 days you know and have you complied to the um the quarantine procedures that has been asked of people now you know so you can ask a number of very specific covid questions and if they are answering in a way that causes concern you would be entitled to not allow them to come back um, and you would encourage that they then go and get a test so with the testing um, if they're not an essential worker in, in work or work in those sectors then they can get tests but they can only get a test if they've got symptoms um, whereas if they were if they are an essential key worker and work in those sectors then they can automatically get uh, tests um, because obviously the nature of where they work so um, you're very much entitled to introduce a self-declaration form and you're very much entitled to ask an employee to go and get tested if they've answered the question where they've got symptoms 
um, and they're you know they're wanting to come back or even if they haven't got symptoms but they've been in contact with somebody um, so there's just a few things to, I guess to think about but mm -hmm. yes you can Thank review you. so um, apologies to everyone we are running slightly over time and uh, we have two more questions left so we will um, work through those two um, you will all be able to have a copy of a link to the recording after this webinar and we'll also send out a copy of the, um, the handouts. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. So um, this question is about somebody self-isolating back in March and had two weeks off sick. Um, they've now had a further absence not related to COVID, which has triggered a formal meeting. Can they take action for COVID-19 absences? Okay, so that's a good question, um, a good practical one. So given the seriousness of COVID and the extent to which it's affected you know, every part of society, um, it would be reasonable for an employee to actually discount that particular absence spell from your normal day-to-day -day absence management procedures. So I would um, take that out of the absence recording. Still have a record of it, but just don't count it in terms of when somebody's due a meeting or not. I think that would be reasonable. Agreed. Mm -hmm. That's it, moved on. So our final question is, my employee has been working throughout lockdown, but wants to use holiday going into next holiday year following the government's announcement that carryover can be for up to two years after. Where do I stand? Okay, so yes, we know the government's changed the rules and made a temporary amendment to the work time regs to allow for that. Um, which, yes, does give people two years to carry holiday over. However, um, employees are still required to ensure that the workers take their statutory holiday uh, entitlement in one year. Um, and, um, you know, you've still got to manage their health and well-being. And actually, as a business, you're still entitled to set your own rules around how you manage holiday and uh, whether you accept decline requests. And so if the business needs dictate that you can't... Um, uh, you know, have everybody accumulating all the holiday for the for next year, then you're entitled to sort of decline requests. Um, so they can't, um, I think it'd be too unrealistic and too much of detrimental impact if somebody's asking to have the whole um, of their holiday this year, next year. Um, but also from a health and safety point of view, you, you've got to have a rest from work, you know, under the working time regs, that's the whole purpose of it. So, um, so yeah, mm -hmm. tricky one, and hopefully you won't get too many people asking to do that, but you're entitled to manage your holiday as you see fit. Yeah. So this has um, raised a number of supplementary questions. I have tried to answer a few as we've been going through, um, but those of you who haven't, as I've promised you, we will come directly back to you after this. Either Victoria or myself will respond to you. Um, we always welcome your feedback so please do let us know um, if there's any suggestions for future topics you'd like us to cover as well that's also um, welcomed we have put up our pr um, program of um, upcoming webinars we've got three scheduled we've got some more coming up for october november and december um, hopefully covering some of the um, brexit and post-covid issues that will be coming up um, we, um, if you'd like to keep in the loop and know about any webinars coming up and also updates on the news as it happens, then subscribe to our newsletters by going to our main website and following the links there. And um, we also keep a webinar archive of all our recordings, which are available to you to watch on demand through our main website. And for those of you who have subscribed to our knowledge base, you can, there's a webinar library there as well. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you for sticking with us to the end. And um, we look forward to uh, welcoming you again on future webinars. Thank you. Yes, thank you, everybody.